So, good morning, everyone. Good evening to, to Natalie over in Australia, and welcome to this webinar on myofascial decompression therapy. So today we're going to be talking about what it is and how it can enhance your practice. I'm Andy Thomas, and I'm director at Physiquip. And at Physiquip, our mission is to raise the standards of rehabilitation through proven innovation. And soft tissue management is, a, is obviously a key part of rehab. And we're always looking for technology that can improve outcomes, both patient and clinician. So we, we offer things such as instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization, focus shockwave, diagnostic ultrasound. But today's session is going to focus on myofascial decompression or negative pressure therapy. So there's um, a few different titles that are relevant to this. So the format for today will be that Dominic will give us a short presentation and then we've got a question and answer session. So I really hope you've all got questions either before or after the presentation because we want to answer those. So if you do have them, please put it in the, the questions on the comment section on the right hand side and we'll address those as and when we can do. If you can all leave yourselves on mute, it will just help avoid any background noise. So our guests today, so I'm delighted we've got Natalie Perkins. Natalie has a degree in both exercise physiology and physiotherapy and has been a clinician for nearly 39 years. 22 of those is the principal of a physio clinic in New South Wales, Australia. She's also a clinical educator for Australian and US doctors of physio programs. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you. And our second guest is Dominic Smith. Dominic is a graduate sport and exercise therapist, and he's been clinical application specialist at Physiquip for six years. And he also leads our Soft Tissue Management Education Academy. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you. So I'm going to pass over to Dominic, who can give us a presentation and then, like I say, get your questions ready and um, let's get going. Yes, thanks, Andy. And good morning to everybody and good evening, Natalie, as well. It's good to see you uh, on the webinar this evening. So, as, I, as you said, I'm a graduate sport exercise therapist uh, by background and I've been using myofascial decompression therapy pretty much since I came out of university and straight into practice. So, well, let's just have a little... Uh, overview of what it actually is and, and let's go into some more of the details of um, exactly what myofascial decompression is. So myofascial decompression I've seen is known as three things. Uh, it's known as targeted negative pressure or just negative pressure. It's just another way of saying it's a suction, a suction or a vacuum therapy. So really they're just different terms that defines this. So when we look at it, it's a treatment modality that utilizes a vacuum. And that creates a suction on the surface of the skin, which creates a lift or decompressive or negative pressures within the tissues. And this is with the reverse of your traditional massage therapy. So traditionally, when we're using hands or other techniques, we're providing a positive force. Your myofascial decompression is the other way to providing negative, so going upwards. From, in, from a perspective of what is available to us to use, that is myofascial decompression, we of course have cupping. Um, which has been used for thousands of years. We know it from traditional medicine uh, from China. And since then it has developed into sort of more mechanical and machine based cupping systems where you can control the pressures. And then more recently, we now have uh, very advanced cupping technologies like lymph and such. And we're gonna have a little explore about how some of these differ as well as we get into the conversation later. But let's have a look at when can you use myofascial decompression? And it can be used for acute and chronic injuries, and it all depends on what pressures you're using and different techniques. And it can be used for a variety of indications, be it for ligament, tendon, muscle, but generally speaking, as Andy touched on before, it's, it's soft tissue injuries, so anything really in the musculoskeletal system. Now, despite having a lot of indications, this is not a one-size-fits-all treatment. And it's one of my big bugbears. I see a lot of people doing it almost as a standard treatment. And it's very much a complementary treatment to what we do with hands and other techniques as well, which we'll hopefully touch on later in the Q&A session. But when we are using it, we need to make sure we're clinically reasoning properly and selecting the patients appropriately to make sure that we can maximise our treatment. And again, it's to complement what you're already doing within that session that patients have. So just some contraindications and, and the quick disclaimer, this is based on the lymph touch medical device, this is based on a medical technology. I know for other things, the contraindications may vary a little bit. So if you are using it, just double check these. Um, but absolute no's like deep vein thrombosis, acute infection particularly, and some of the leads. And then relatively, you need to think about cancers, pregnancy, any of the vascular conditions, and any of the medications that they may be on that could affect or could be affected by treatment. So 
if you are new to my fascial decompression, I would check um, what those contraindications are to make sure you can it safely. So a quick question on why do we actually use it? I'll split this into two areas. So looking at it from a clinical aspect, but then as private practice um, in myself, um, is actually looking at it from a business perspective as well. So clinically, it's effective and it gets results. Um, and that's the main thing. That's what we are in um, our line of work for. We want to help patients out and help them get better. So using something that works and gets reduces their amount of pain and increases their function, that's what we want to do. The second thing is it offers us more than what we can actually do with our hands. So I'm a massive hands-on practitioner. I like to feel, and I think your hands are the best tools that you have um, in, your, in your clinical tool set. However, like any treatment and modality out there, they have their limits. Well, limits being it can only provide two, two mechanisms of movement, positive pressure and lateral movement. And we also have our own pain threshold. Um, I'm sure we've all done it when we've done a lot of manual treatments. You get to the end of the day and your hands are just knackered. Um, so it's something that as well, it's a bit of a self-preservation thing. But also you're offering more ways of moving the tissue for the patient. I'm going to apologise in advance because it's such a cliché statement, but it is more tools in the toolbox. Um, it's such a cliché, but the more things that we have, it gives us more variability. So when our patient comes in with a tendinopathy, or a, a muscle injury or joint problem, the more tools we have means that we can clinically select those to maximize result. From a business perspective, um, there's a wider range of options for our, for our patients. So we have um, lots of different options. If your patient is coming in, then they get a choice of what they get as well, and you are able to offer a lot more. And it also helps us differentiate from the clinics that are around us. So the more treatments we offer and not being too one dimensional in the treatments that we do and provide, it means we're going to differentiate ourselves from relative competition. And in some cases, it does generate a new revenue stream as well, which again, we'll touch on later in the Q&A. So let's get into the real fundamentals of actually how does it work? And there's, you know, when you look at the clinical evidence, there's mixtures on, on how, what people think it works. And what I've derived from the reading that I've done also on a clinical experience is that negative pressure will have a different effect depending on a few things. And that can be the amount of pressure that you're applying. So the millimeters mercury that you're actually applying. Are you using a continuous suction or an intermittent pulse of negative pressure? Is it a static or active treatment? And by that, I mean, are you just a static continuous hold of pressure or are you actually getting the cup or the myofascial decompression and moving that along the tissue and actually working it almost as a massage technique? And then also, is your patient static? Are they just lie prone on the bed and you have cups on and they're just static waiting there for two, three minutes? Or do we actually have them moving through a particular range Are you under some controlled resistance as well? So all these different factors um, will have an effect on your clinical outcome. And it all ultimately boils down to what injury they have and what is your clinical um, assessment and reasoning and what is, your, what is the outcome that you're aiming for. So we look at the effect of the pressures. So, Looking at lighter pressures, but sort of between 20 and 80 millimetres mercury of, of, of uh, mercury, we can stimulate lymphatic flow. So by that, we mean the lymphatic capillaries, we can actually expand. This is on a very, very minute level, um, and we can actually open that lymphatic system. So when you have any edema, which is predominantly with any injury, be it acute or chronic, we will have some inflammation and some edema in those exercise phases. What we're going to do is open up the lymphatic system, get the fluid into the lymphatics and process that off, and that helps with our healing. Simultaneously, that will also increase blood flow. So we can create localised pressure drops, and we know that fluid moves from high pressures to low pressures. So creating localised pressure drops brings blood and fluid into the area. And so it brings your nutrients, proteins, and other aspects to help with tissue healing. And the other aspect is reducing pain. So where you have... Um, pain or pressure on the nerves that may be a cause of uh, fluid in the area. By helping remove that fluid, you can help remove some of that pain. But also that negative pressure can stimulate the proprioceptors, the baroreceptors and mechanoreceptors because you're changing the different pressures in the tissue, you're changing how the tissue is moving. And by affecting those receptors, we get to override the nociceptors, the pain signals in there as well. So the higher pressures, oh, sorry, I don't know how that uh, has just got onto there. Um, so the higher pressures, so we're looking at between 150 to 350, and you'll notice there is a little bit of a gap here between the higher and lower pressures, and that is dependent on where, what area of the body you're working on. So for the lighter pressures sort of on that aspect, you might have to be up to 100 to be able to stimulate lymphatic flow, maybe for example on the leg. 
um, or if you're looking at sort of scar tissue, you may be looking at like sort of 120 if you're on head and neck, something like that. But the higher pressures are more for releasing fascial restrictions. I say releasing, um, it's manipulating those structures and creating space between those layers. And that can help the glide of these tissues. It also can help with the lymphatic and blood flow because we know that the vessels between the fascial tissues are in those areas. So if you have a compression or restriction in fascia, that is also going to restrict your blood and your lymphatic flow. So creating more room will allow everything to move in there. We can also improve scar or collagen production because we can offer a third dimension of movement. So we mentioned again, hands and, and other positive pressure techniques are very much positive pressures and lateral movements. A negative pressure will help lift around the actual cup that you're using, you'll get an area of positive pressure and then we can still glide. And what we're doing is we're stimulating the fibroblasts. So we know fibroblasts and other cells that are responsible for tissue healing and mechanically responsive. So creating mechanical forces, we can then stimulate those cells to do their jobs, which you might be familiar with the, the term mechanotransduction. If you're not familiar with the, the term mechanotransduction, um, type that into Google. Um, there's a couple of papers on that um, and you can have a look on, on some more information for that. And obviously from the higher pressures as well, you can relieve pain that's affected by musculoskeletal tightness. Um, and the same again, we can still stimulate those proprioceptors, baro and mechanoreceptors. So I'm just going to show you a little way of how you can use it. Now, this is with uh, GB boxing physiotherapist Ian Gatt, um, who is using pressure um, it's, uh, over on the back of the shoulder. And he's going to show you how you can incorporate a bit of movement into this. So he's put a bit of cream on the back and on the shoulder and using a continuous negative pressure there. He's able to work on the posterior shoulder and help release some of those fascial restrictions that he sees a lot in boxers. And what he's going to show is a really nice combination with how you can use it with a positive pressure. So this is your ice dam technique with the hawk grip tools. So you've been able to decompress those structures to start off with, and then he uses a positive pressure to really get in to those tissues again as well. So nice combination there with those. Then just looking onto the back, again with a, a, a continuous pressure, it's incorporating a bit of movement. So somebody's got a bit of scapular restriction, a bit of tightness. One of the points I make on this is if somebody is actually experiencing pain when they're contracting it, then I like to be able to treat them when they are in that contracted position, not when they're lower down. So it's trying to get patient involvement as well and making it a, a quite an active treatment. Now, obviously, if your patient can't, can't move for whatever reason, then, you know, obviously we have to deal with that um, from that aspect. But you can include active and passive. And also on the lower back, to give you an idea of actually how you can still use a, a technique or a device like Lymphotouch to have a continuous pressure, massage up and down erect spinous, but then actually particularly hold it on an area and then use your hands as well. So you can actually have a combination treatment all at the same time um, as negative pressure. So really this is kind of showing you how you have a control. And the major thing with this as well is that with this particular treatment, I'm able to control exactly what pressure I'm in. So I'm not creating too much erythema. I'm not creating too much um, uh, soreness or tenderness for the patient, but I'm able to, uh, to control that and double up my treatments in that sense. So one of the questions I always get is who can actually use my fascial decompression technique? So that's just a very, very quick overview list. So if you're physio, sports therapy, chiro, osteopath, nurse, the list kind of goes on. But realistically, anyone who's a healthcare professional, soft tissue therapist, but if you have a good understanding of anatomy and physiology and you understand how myofascial decompression is affecting the tissue and how it complements you in clinic, and you're able to clinically justify and reason the use of it, then you can absolutely use it. It's, it's definitely it's another cliche for you. It's a, an extension of your hands. It recognises that your hands are limited in that you can't provide negative pressure, so you're using something that can to complement what you're already doing. So just there's some important things to consider um, if you're looking into myofascial decompression or if you currently use it. It's one of the questions I'm always asking is how much pressure are you using and can you control that pressure? Why are you also using it? Is it better to use lighter pressures for um, helping with fluid drainage or is it better to use higher pressures to help with fascial releasing, that kind of thing? And, and ultimately, I want to be able to control those. And then I always want to think what techniques am I using in them and why? So I'm using a static continuous suction, so you know, a cup on the shoulder, particularly in one place. Am I using continuous movement like Ian Gat showed on the back of the shoulder? We're actually continuously moving it. And are we using an intermittent pulse of negative pressure where the pressure lifts and drops? Or are we having a continuous um, 
suck and hold. So that's the presentation done. We've got some key take home messages on here. So we really need to understand the differences between the, the different uh, techniques and systems that are available to you and really understand what they're actually doing. Know the different pressures you're using and make sure you can control these pressures will certainly help you target your treat, treatment and maximize your results. And then consider as well, introducing active movement into your techniques if you don't already do that. So have a look at maybe moving the cups or, in, or in, encouraging patient involvement as well and actually encouraging that movement that will help improve function. So that's the presentation done and I'll, I'll hand back to Andy. We can get some Q&A done. Thanks, Dom. Just while we're doing this, your audio is dropping in and out a little bit. So then if you can address that while we go on to the next thing. Yeah, I will do. Yeah. Thanks. So before we go into um, some, some of the Q&As, again, please put your questions in on the side. If you could all just answer this poll, please. So just, just talking about which of these treatments do you currently offer? So you can should be able to choose as many as you want from there. It'd be good to get some feedback. You can't see the numbers going up and down, but it's quite interesting seeing them come through. Great, okay. So just for, for our speakers, so yeah, quite interesting in terms of this. Soft tissue massage, not surprisingly, is, is top of that. But just looking at that, Natalie, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's, it's quite a, a range of different things there. The people that have put other, it'd be interesting if you could put those in the, the comment section as well, because it'd be good for us to, to have a look at those. Were you surprised to see those sort of results, Natalie? Um, given that I did it too, and I ticked the top five things as well. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and look, you know, obviously being a clinician that really believes in manual therapy being really the best form of therapy that you can offer in conjunction with, you know, exercise and all that sort of stuff. But in terms of you know, getting patients in a position where they can actually do exercises um, and strength work and all that sort of stuff. Um, you, you can't beat soft tissue release. So it's actually very pleasing to see that um, there are other therapists out there still doing it. Um, it's, I, I, I feel like it's a bit of a dying art in Australia now. We used to be so good at it and people are moving away from it for some bizarre reason. Um, and I think like the, the cupping, which is what, um, you know, I was introduced to it oh, back when um, I think, pterodactyls roam to the earth. Um, you know, this the lymphotouch really is a, a much more sophisticated version of the same thing. Um, and I think far more useful than certainly what I experienced in cupping. So um, I think those people who are using it are already obviously seeing the benefits of negative pressure therapy. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good mix of things. Yeah, no, that's great. And in terms of Dominic's presentation, what were your thoughts in terms of that? I mean, you've been using this technique for, for a number of years now. Can you just kind of talk me through your interpretation of, uh, of, of that topic area? Yeah, in term, like in terms of the clinical applications specifically? Pretty much, yeah, just how, how you got involved with it and your sort of, what was your clinical reasoning when, when you started looking at this? Oh, okay, yeah. So, I mean, essentially for many years, um, I really had come to rely purely on manual therapy. Um, and I think because, you know, back in Neanderthal times when I learned electrotherapy, it was, you know, shortwave diatomy and, and ultrasound and interferential. Um, and, you know, because they were really the only things that were available at the time, we used them. But I always had questions about their efficacy and I never really saw any significant wow factor. Um, so as a result, I got more and more disillusioned with anything that plugged into a wall. Um, and because I got good, such good results um, consistently with my hands, I learned to trust my hands more than anything and basically went, well, I can take these everywhere and I don't need to recharge them. So um, it's, it's pretty easy just to get stuck into manual therapy. Um, and then I um, had a chance meeting with a, a colleague from um, uh, Johns Hopkins um, hospital in Baltimore who has lots of toys to play with and um, 
decided to show me some of those toys and I, I was you know pretty skeptical um, and it was even things like shockwave which are, are used readily now and I now use on a daily basis um, but the the lymphotouch was something that he actually showed me and I kind of went oh of, of all the toys that are there this is possibly my least favorite um, until I came to actually use it <laughs> and then you know I test things by putting my hands on and then applying whatever it is, whichever a toy is being thrown at me. And I need to feel a difference to the tissue um, with my hands, you know, before and after the use of the machine. And I was blown away with how, I guess, how well the tissue responded um, with negative pressure therapy and quite differently from what I'd experienced with cupping, which also surprised me. So I feel like the, the capacity to do the intermittent pressure makes a difference. Uh, um, the capacity to very easily and objectively control the amount of pressure you use um, makes a difference. I think the suction because of the, um, the, the rubber lip makes a difference. Um, so I kind of had to eat a very big slice of humble pie and discover that, yeah, some of these toys are actually really helpful um, and that they did make a difference. And more than anything, from a clinical perspective, um, the hands-on work that I do nearly always is painful to the patient. And that pain dissipates as the tissue releases, as I'm sure all of you have experienced. But I was able to get a tissue release, which for the most part um, was pleasurable for the patient. Um, so I have lots of patients now saying, can I have the sucky sucky, which is what they call it here. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, look, I'm a complete convert to it, basically. Yeah, and in terms of that, what what would you say is the can't narrow it down to one thing, but what are you trying to achieve when you're when you when you're using using this? Um, well, essentially, I guess the the treatment model that um, I operate with is that um, for whatever reason, be it neurological, be it um, you know strengths, be it um, postural, you you tending to find that patients are coming in with pain due to overloaded tissue that um, and as I describe it to, to patients you know when I lie them down um, their muscles really should relax to a, a normal tone um, because they're not fighting against gravity and they're not moving um, and what I palpate is a muscle that's virtually fully contracted so as I describe it to the patients it's like well if it's fully contracted at rest what on earth is it doing when you actually need it to lift something or to move you or to hold you up against gravity um, and for some reason which I can't explain when I put my thumbs into that very contracted muscle that active muscle um, active when it should be at rest um, it hurts so using negative pressure, I'm able to get that muscle to release, um, be it through mechanotransduction, um, you know, whatever the, is it a neural stimulation? I don't know. Is it the, you know, some chemical thing? I don't know. Is it a blood flow thing? Um, whatever, as a clinician, I'm, I'm interested and intrigued by the, the why, but fundamentally, as long as it does the job, I don't really care. Um, and essentially, I'm looking to get that um, contracted active tissue to to let go um, and then I always start with my hands to feel it I then use the negative pressure and then I'll always go back to hands for some fine tuning um, but I do find that it it takes a significant load off my hands which after all the, these years are actually getting quite sore and arthritic um, but more than anything the the patient's not in a lot of pain and we have an amazing reputation for treating um, muscul musculoskeletal um, issues very effectively and very rapidly um, but we also have an amazing reputation in the local community for also hurting people in the process so to be able to give them the same result without the discomfort of treatment um, to me was absolute gold. Um, what would you say was like a, a sort of typical what, what, what were the main bit of your patients that come through the door what sort of people do you see? Oh, gosh, we are such a diverse clinic. Um, we see paediatrics to geriatrics and couch potatoes to Olympic athletes. Um, so I have quite a lot of um, professional sports people, but I similarly have just quite a lot of weekend warriors or, as I said, couch potatoes, you know, regular humans that scarcely move. Um, I have personally developed a reputation for treating complex spinal issues so I get a very high level of um, I guess chronic pain and complex spine problems and it's a little bit because I see a lot I get the reputation that I 
um, than see a lot, which is why I see a lot. Um, but I do see basically every, more every joint, um, all ages and all stages. Um, and I would say well, probably all the, the tools in my toolbox, um, probably the LymphaTouch is the one that I use the most regularly. I'd, I'd use it on almost every patient. Um, okay, that's so interesting. Can I was going to Sorry. say that just, I want to come to you on this one as well, but in terms of a question from Laura, so talking about research in this area to show the effects of opening lymphatic vessels, fascial release, increased sliding, that sort of thing. Uh, any comments on, on that question? So, I mean, from the lymphatic perspective, um, obviously that's, you know, looking at something that's controlled negative pressure, so something can actually control specific pressures. There's quite a lot of research in the effect of negative pressure. Um, the, I mean, I'm just trying to think now of some of the papers that I can quite, I can quote quite a few papers, which we can send out afterwards if you want to. But in terms of the, the like the lymphotouch specifically, um, was born in chronic edema. That was where it was born in. And, you know, there's evidence to say that you can shift anywhere between sort of 200 milliliters of fluid in an hour um, out, of, out of an affected limb. Um, but there's a recent research paper that was back in 2018, looking at the different of effects on positive and negative pressure on the lymphatic system, um, done by Professor James Moore Jr., which actually we have, we have a webinar with him in a couple of weeks on this subject. Um, but he was showing that on a, on a small lymphatic vessel, how a pressure can actually, you know, too much can actually close the vessel and prevent that actually for that fluid from going. And negative pressure, the right amount of negative pressure actually opens enough to increase the flow. Um, but really from a superficial capillary perspective, that negative pressure pulls on the anchor filaments around the lymphatic capillary in which you have these endothelial cells around the, around the vessel. And as you pull the anchor filament, that opens up a channel between the two that allows your fluid in. And then obviously once the fluid is done, it will then process. Um, obviously if you have a fully functioning lymphatic system. Yeah, okay, no, that's, thanks for that. Yeah, I think definitely the Professor James Moore event would be a really good one. So we'll, we'll send more details about that one because he, he'll definitely be looking at it from, from the research standpoint. Yeah, we've got another question here from Lauren. So Natalie, do you find that it saves time using lymphotouch compared to more of a hands-on soft tissue release techniques? Um, yes, I do. It depends on the patient. Um, sometimes it can save an awful lot of time. I, um, I tend to find, you know, I've been doing this thing for a while and I'm yet to work, I'm yet to crack the code when it comes to knowing exactly which patient is going to respond best to which technique and I certainly have not bought into any single technique as being you know the holy grail of physiotherapy um, I find it personally incredibly fascinating that you'll get you know five patients all presenting with what appears to be exactly the same condition and they will all respond quite differently to every treatment um, intervention that I do um, as I said I've, I've spent a long time trying to to see the similarities and try and, you know, so I can get a shortcut, you know, okay, this is what I need to do. Um, and I think the lymphotouch is no different in that I find some bodies just, they melt under it. Um, and, you know, so when I discover those patients that have this response to it, I will use it, you know, primarily, that'll be the, the biggest part of their, uh, the start of their treatment because I get such rapid results from their their body that you know in five minutes I can do something that would otherwise have taken me twenty if I've done kind of a, a compressive you know massage style manual therapy. Um, again, the pain factor is a is a huge one. So um, I find people who are incredibly sensitive um, to to touch and and particularly that that fascial pain which um i i often say to patients that you know you can feel what is well i assume it's a, a fascial tension um and i i will always preempt the patient you know and say look this will probably feel like i've grabbed a handful of, of broken glass and i'm rubbing it through your glutes or up your back um or i i'll i'll say you know the favorite one that they like is that i'll say oh this will probably feel like i'm giving um uh, it's like Edward Scissorhands giving you a massage. Um, so that it's a very distinct cutting um, sharp sensation. Um, and again, I find it fascinating that patients when I use the lymphotouch don't have that discomfort and, and certainly not the sharpness. You know, they might feel a bit of a pull, but certainly no pain associated with it. So 
Um, I think that also enables you to do a sort of a constant treatment rather than having to sort of do a few sweeps and let the tissue kind of recover and then start again and let the patient recover. Um, so on the whole, I think, yes, it saves a lot of time. Um, I do get faster results um, when used in the, you know, for the right patient at the right time. But um, there's not too many patients that I end up going, ah, this really isn't doing it for you. Um, whereas I do find with some of the other, you know, the shockwave or, um, you know, I do use uh, the hook grips tools. Um, sometimes I just find that the tissue doesn't respond. And, and as I said at the beginning, I think the LymphaTouch is one of the few tools that um, I haven't had a, either a negative or a, a, well, not a positive result with, like a nothing re result with, where I, I pretty much have with everything else I've used. And that might be my skill in using um, the various tools, but I think that's one of the beauties of LymphaTouch is that, you know, I, I have students use it and I take students regularly. And um, I feel that you know, manual therapy, unfortunately, is as much art as it is science. And as with any art, you can you can send someone to singing school for a decade, but you can't teach them how to sing a note that gives the audience goosebumps. And I think that there are therapists that just have a better innate feel with their hands. Um, and I can enhance what's there as a mentor, but I can never teach it if it isn't there. But what I found is that LymphaTouch kind of is the cheat's way of if you don't have good feel, you can still get really good manual therapy results. Um, so the students love it because they can feel like heroes because even though they don't have the skill and some of them don't even have the, the feel, um, they still get really good um, soft tissue releases that, that make patients love them. Can I come back to some with from a myofascial decompression as the technique as a whole? Obviously, we see like a range of different techniques from like the very basic cupping techniques which I use um, on occasion. What I want to know what your opinion is on when we see like the big bruises, or when people actually go out and, and, and provide the bruises in comparison to what you might do in clinic. Um, you know, what's what's your kind of take on that aspect? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, um... When it comes to cupping, I'm grateful that we're in Australia, which is not nearly as litigious a society as the US, um, because I know some people just with the bruising are aghast at, you know, what you've done. Um, that said, I think, you know, to be able to get a similar result and, and in my experience, having used both cupping and LymphaTouch, a, a better clinical result with LymphaTouch without the bruises um, is a, a better option. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, if you're looking at it traditionally um, and in the Eastern philosophy, um, part of the erythema and the bruising that occurs with the Eastern philosophy is that you're kind of releasing that bad blood um, kind of concept. So um, certainly in Eastern society, they see the bruising as a positive thing. In Western cultures, we see it as slightly more of a, a negative thing. Um, personally, I think and that was one of the things that fascinated me was the intermittent nature of the, the lymphotouch when you use it in um, that capacity it can still give you the same tissue release as cupping um, without any erythema at all, um, basically. So I've not had a single patient um, with any form of bruising when I've used the intermittent setting. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of patients actually prefer that, particularly in Australian summer when they're walking around in bikinis. So... No, that's good. I know we had a conversation about it on LinkedIn, didn't we? Because um, I'm frankly, I'm not a massive fan of the bruising. Um, I don't. I, in my head, and I'd say, like you said, I think it might be that sort of Western world of of thinking with it. It's that bruising is a secondary. You know, you're just creating a bruise. You're directly creating a problem. It's like bruise is what we associate with tissue trauma. Um, and if we're going out to active, I kind of see it as the you know, you kind of you, you're not facilitating healing. You're creating another problem for the body to heal. That's where I sort of come at it. I know there might be people on here that might use cupping that would see it from a completely different perspective, um, which is obviously that's why, you know, I, I like to debate about it and have a debate. And obviously if people can share any any of their experiences on, on what they're doing physiologically, I'm happy to hear about it. But I think it's, I much prefer sort of that, like you say, with the control of the pressure and being able to work with your vascular system and your lymphatic system and actually being able to create a little bit of pinkness. I don't mind pink. But I think I don't want to go as far as the, the black and blue um, and leaving, leaving bruises for days. 
Yeah, well, you, you raise a good point that you're essentially like, obviously, if you end up with blood in the interstitial tissue, then the system has to go through the process of cleaning all of that up and there'll be an inflammatory response that relates to that. But, you know, at the end of the day, the the you will only get that erythema if it's, you know, cupping or lymphotouch or whatever, um, even the, um, the, the tools. Um, if there is excessive blood flow in the tissue, like normal tissue won't respond with that um, horrific erythema um, anyway. So to me, it's like, you, you know, the body is already in a state of distress and you're getting engorgement of the local blood vessels. So applying a, a positive or negative pressure, but an increased pressure to a, a vessel that's already engorged um, is, is probably the reason that it causes it to, to break and you get leaching of the red blood cells into the interstitial tissue. Um, mm. I, I do wonder too whether you have a, a chemical reaction occurring um, because of the inflammation, because of the engorgement, because of probably the influx of calcium that seems to mess everything up um, in terms of actually reducing the viability of the, the I guess, vessel wall, making it, you know, it's, it's arguably an acidic condition. You've you've uh, increased the pressure of blood flowing in because you've got contraction of the muscle around the blood vessel. So there's an increased pressure for the blood to get in. It's not flowing out freely. You get a buildup of um, metabolites in the area. You're going to get a buildup of um, lactate and hydrogen ions, um, creating a local acidic environment, which as we know, acid tends to thin things out. So it would make sense to me from a chemical perspective that you are actually causing some degree of um, thinning out or, or vulnerability to the to the blood vessels. Hence, you apply either a positive or negative pressure. Um, we certainly cause bruising um, regularly with our manual therapy. Um, yeah. And we yeah. warn patients beforehand. Um, we cause a lot of post-treatment tenderness. Um, but again, it's usually only with the first session. Um, it happens when their tissue is at its worst. And we find that we will do the same thing in subsequent sessions and they'll not report any discomfort and have no post-treatment bruising or minimal tenderness. So similar sort of concept. And just coming back on that, so someone's asked whether it would be safe to use with clients who've got diabetes or heart related problems. Dom? Um, so with heart related problems, if you're doing like a lymphatic drainage technique, um, we've got evidence that basically it shifts a lot of fluid. And if you've got a cardiovascular problem or even a kidney problem, you don't want to smash that system with a load of returning fluid that it's got to deal with. Um, so obviously if somebody's got a vascular issue and anybody comes up with any kind of vascular issue, my flag goes up in clinic and I go, hmm, probably, you know, if it's, if it's past my remit, I will probably either refer on or actually, you know, speak to their consultant and, and try and find out what's actually reasonable, but tends to be with a vascular issue may stay um, away from it um, unless it's a local treatment. But that's something obviously, you know, you, you'll learn with, with training over time. Um, from a diabetes perspective, I just don't use very high pressures. We know with diabetes, they take a little bit longer to heal. Um, and I don't want to be causing big bruises. So I tend to use lighter pressures. Um, Otherwise, I've not really had much of an issue with those patients. The vascular ones I, I, I'm, I'm careful with because um, I don't want to, you know, cause too much fluid return um, that over, overstresses the system too much. Uh, and diabetes, I say lighter pressure is fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few bit of a backlog of questions here. So Rosie's asking, does anyone know of a, a way to objectively measure tissue pliability in scar or soft tissue? So Rosie's an, actually an existing user of the system. So, Natalie? Um, poke it. <laughs> so, no, uh, I, I, I don't think I, I've come up with any truly objective measure except the my own um, intrinsic gauge of what my hands tell me, um, So, which is completely non-reproducible, very low inter-rater and intra-rater reliability on that one. Yeah. I mean, that, Rosie, that is something which we've looked at previously. So we, we were looking at a system. Um, so I can send details of that afterwards. But yeah, at the moment, we've not got anything that's that's directly able to objectively measure that. I was going to say, there was, there's a system that looks at like the rebound of it, isn't it? I can't remember what it was called. It's called and then, so it's a product yeah, of Estonia. Yeah. And I think there's um, there may be functions on di some certain, certain diagnostic ultrasound bits of kit that can look at tissue pliability and elasticity. It tends to be used in more cardiac ultrasound. So I don't know how it could transfer to tissue. Um, but I know there is a 
there is a feature on some systems for, for that. Okay, great. And in terms of what, what creams do you use? Do you use emollient? What do you use, Natalie, when you're, when you're using LymphaTouch? Um, we have a, a yet to be patented, very special, unique cream. Uh, so I can't tell you. Um, now, we, we actually use Kofa. So um, for all of our soft tissue work, um, we use a, 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 it's a, I don't think you guys even have Kofa. It's a coconut, essentially a coconut um, uh, oil, but solid at room temperature. Um, and um, it's like, it's great for the manual therapy. And like we add a little bit of um, just regular rice bran oil to do it. To, so it's not solid, completely solid at room temperature. Um, but uh, it, it, for the manual therapy side of things, it, it gives a nice lubrication without being as slippery as oil is. Um, and I find it's similar with the LymphaTouch that it gives you um, just a nice glide across the skin when you're using um, the device without kind of feeling like you're sort of just, you know, rolling around on a, on a layer of oil. So that's what we use. Okay, great. Dom, what's your experience of what people use? Um, I mean, I tend to stay away from oil, like some of the oil-based ones, because it's like the greasiness. Sometimes use like creams. I, I tend to use like an E45 or Diagram to like an absorbent. I don't like to get greased up um, and I don't like my device getting greased up or my cups because it can be a nightmare to clean. It might mean that you have to just replenish it every now and again, but it's like you can get a little light, light greasing. It's not like you're basting somebody and stuff. It's just, you know, it's a light greasing just helps it glide. I tend to use like a moisturizer, um, occasionally like one of the massage creams, but not the oils. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, another question. So with the release of fascial tension, what prescribed follow-up of exercises would you consider broad spectrum? I hope hypermobile patients, tight and taut muscles, but perhaps using fascial tightness as their supporting strength. Is there a considered risk for greater injury rather than prevention, Natalie? Um, I'm not quite sure I follow the question. Um... So yeah, so we're talking about, so with the release of fascial tension, so with the yeah. follow-up exercises with hypermobile patients, so if, if that fascial tightness is supporting the strength already by releasing oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. issues. Yeah, but um, I mean, fundamentally, my, my view is that the, the tension in the tissue that we're releasing is a dysfunctional tension. Um, and a lot of the time it's, um, it's a reactive um, tension rather than a, a positive, um, helpful um, contraction. So, uh, and I think that you end up with uh, a significant degree of, um, I, I suspect it's a neural input problem that you know, people get into these dysfunctional movement patterns because we are, as humans, I believe we're masters of compensatory strategies. Um, and a lot of the things I see when I'm seeing chronic pain patients is that somewhere along the line, they've, they've either done, you know, some repeated, I hesitate to use the word trauma, but, you know, repetition of movement that's caused the same muscles, the same joints, the same loads to be placed on a tissue um, for far too long. And then, or, or they've had a, an injury incident and they've a, a developed this maladaptive way of moving. And it might be very subtle, um, but it's really not the way the anatomy was designed to. So you get this dysfunctional um, tissue response to that. So to me, reducing all of the dysfunctional tension and kind of setting everything down to base level and, and starting again, like having a, a completely fat, flat foundation that you're going to build on, um, that to me is what I'm trying to achieve. So um, I understand the, the notion of, okay, is, is that tight fascia actually the one thing that's holding a hypermobile patient up? Um, and certainly if you're um, looking at EDS, you kind of wonder whether that's the case. Um, but even with the EDS people that we have, it's like, um, no, when we get their bodies moving correctly with appropriate exercise and, and giving them the freedom to move correctly, that's really what, uh, really across all of the patients I see, that's my underlying philosophy is uh, I want to release the tissue tension so that I can give them the freedom to move correctly. And then the next stage is coaching them in that um, new movement, that correct movement and giving them strength to be able to do that um, appropriately. 
And have, you ever, have you ever looked at so you, you were a diagnostic ultrasound user? Have you ever used it in conjunction with Lymphotouch to kind of see that any changes? Um, no, I possibly have, but can't recall. I, I can't recall an, a um, specific target that I, I did that for. So um, I think I've just looked at a few things, but sort of anecdotally and not taken terribly much notice, really. So probably no is the best answer. <laughs> OK, all right. Yeah, maybe we'll come back to that one as well. So we've got a question here in terms of the cost of the machines. So the machines, people tend to uh, lease them. So it works out around about £150 per month. They do that. But in terms of the cost, Natalie, what's, how do you justify it? Because it is a cost. You can use hands-on cups, et cetera, which are a lot cheaper. What are your thoughts around that? Um, well, to me, it's saving my hands. So it's buying me years in um, my career. Um, and, you know, I'm being quite honest with that. So I go, what price can you put on your own comfort as a therapist? And what price can you put on your capacity to, to pay your mortgage and your bills? So um, from a selfish perspective, it's like, well, I'll use anything that, as long as I still get the, the good patient outcomes, I will use anything that saves me. Um, so to me, it was a bit of a no-brainer as far as a capital investment. Um, and I think we spend as clinicians and clinic owners, which I am, we spend all sorts of money on all sorts of things that, you know, over the course of a lifetime as a therapist add up to probably far more than the limp touch would as a capital investment. But it's a bit like people say, oh, I can't afford physiotherapy treatment. And yet they'll buy, you know, a, a takeaway latte every day. And because it only costs $5, um, what's that, two and a half pound? Um, five dollars a day they they go oh, i can afford it. they don't realize that it's cost them you know 1500 bucks a year in coffee um in after tax money so i think sometimes as a clinician obviously you can get a little bit concerned by the capital investment but if you do it um based on uh, i guess an hourly rate it's like a bed you know oh geez a bed a mattress is expensive but you go well yes if, you, if you're sleeping on it from seven to eight hours a day um divided by how many of your years that uh, you have it um a, a daily rate is actually very very low so um i think i was able to very easily justify the the capital expense because i knew that you know the return on that investment just from my own personal comfort was enough for me um and I can just add all sorts of other reasons why I did it too, but that, that was enough for me. I mean, just from my perspective on, on like the return, Natalie, like how do you, like, because we get a lot of people like, do you price separately for it or do you like, and that can be, like, the touch can be cupping or whatever. What's your views on like having like separate prices for different treatments or do you just bundle it all into one, one hourly rate or one flat rate? Um, I think it depends a little on your demographic. I know um, there are some uh, clinics that do that and their patients are, are more than happy to swallow that. Uh, I personally struggle with that philosophy because I feel like I'm saying, well, I can give you a mediocre treatment for this much, but if you really want the, the five star, it's going to cost you extra. Now, whilst we maybe appreciate that when we're purchasing cars or, or other items and we understand that, that quality costs. Um, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but in Australia, everybody expects five star. Um, and there's an element of, I don't want my health to be viewed as a business. Um, so I think when you start adding costs to things, um, that really focuses the client on the fact that you know this is a business and that your concern is more about the dollars that you're going to get from them rather than helping them which is for my personal opinion not a great way to to create a sustainable long-term business um, and on that note um, the sustainable long-term business I mean we have 95 percent of our clientele is word of mouth referred um, and the reason they refer to us is because we get results rapidly um, and that patients aren't going back for six weeks um, where you could argue that mother nature's taken care of the most of that um, workload anyway um, and i see that these tools and therefore the capital expense that comes with them is the best way to get that um, rapid result um, it's the best way to maintain uphold and progress our reputation and fundamentally um, from a business perspective the thing that's really going to provide you with a you know financial security is is growth um, and growth comes by you know customers 
you know, new customers are necessary. Um, so, you know, I've had patients say, oh, my friend told me about the sucky sucky machine. Can I have that? Um, so it's one of the few tools that patients actually will specifically say they've heard about. Um, we are the only one um, in our area that has it. Um, and people are starting to hear that, hey, I can get the same amazing results at Body Works that I used to get and it doesn't hurt as much anymore. So uh, that's gold. And it's a general question, if it does also relate to Limpertouch, but when, when you're presented with technology, how much do you look into, say, research into it? Like how important is that to you for, to see that? Um, from the first point, um, so if I, if I take the example of, of working with Ken at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, obviously he introduced me to, well, three products that I'd, I'd never seen or played with before as I said I was inherently skeptical um that my first port of call was is and always shall be does it make a difference to my client um we are a patient centric business um so it will always be my hands first as a, an assessment do whatever with your fancy toy and then my hands will make the judgment call as to whether I think the fancy toy is is worth looking at um then then I purchased the fancy toy then I use the fancy toy and whilst using it, that's when I start looking at the, well, what does the research say? Um, I think we're in an environment now in um, physiotherapy and even worse in physical therapy in, in um, America that I said I, I have a lot of dealings with because I um, take their students and I'm um, with, uh, you know, a couple of the universities over there. Um, it's almost become trendy to have the first question out of everybody's mouth is, well, what's the evidence? Um, and you go, well, if you actually do bother to read evidence, um, you will discover that there are gaping great holes in pretty much every single paper that is written. Um, if we look at the systematic reviews with meta-analysis, um, which is deemed to be our highest level of research evidence, the, the questions are so specific that you will take 2,000 papers and you'll whittle it down to 11 that met the criterion. Now, I'm interested in the 2,000 papers and, well, what was the overwhelming um, judgment? Yes, on different pa patient populations, which is not what our systematic review with meta-analysis is about. But to me, if that many people have bothered to do research on a topic, it's, it's obviously significant enough to, to warrant it. Now, one of the issues is that we, you have to have the technique before you have the research. So if somebody comes up with something, you know, say if I invent a new technique tomorrow that I find in my clinic is blazingly effective and somebody says to me, well, where's your research? Well, obviously I haven't had a chance to research it. It's very new. So I think sometimes we kind of put the cart before the horse when we demand research on things that really are relatively new to, to science and really the research concept is relatively new to science and and I say look we've been researching cancer for decades it would have to be one of the most um, clinically researched uh, medical conditions that we have on the face of the planet and yet I cannot predictably determine what somebody's response is going to be to a treatment um, I can't predictably determine um, what dose and, and whether chemo versus radio, you know, is going to be best for them. We can look at retrospective data and say, well, all of these people responded, but we can't say for that specific patient whether or not it's going to work for them. Um, and yet I think in physiotherapy, you know, we're supposed to come up with evidence to show that we, we've got a handle on what causes lower back pain. I mean, we've got an evidence on all of the things that don't cause lower back pain, which is pretty much every single anatomical site that there is. Um, so I think we have to be a little careful about, are we asking, show me the research because, you know, why are we asking that? It, I, I'm not saying it's not important and I think it needs to be done, but I think sometimes it's a little bit of a, I personally feel like it's almost like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to show that I'm an academic and that I'm up with all of the latest scientific stuff. Um, so I really want to know what the science says rather than going, well, try it, see if it works for you. And if you were at the forefront and the frontier of research, what would you be thinking based on your own, I guess, knowledge from um, not only your university training, but your clinical experience? If you had to come up with a, well, why do you think this might work? And you had to come up with a research paper rather than relying on somebody else to do it, 
what would you make up as being a possible plausible um, clinical explanation and, and, and physiological explanation for why something works? Um, and then use the research to kind of see whether somebody else has asked the same question and whether they've come up with an answer for you. But um, long answer to a short question. Um, research is valuable, but it's definitely not my personal first go-to and yes I do lecture a lot and when I lecture I obviously read as much of the research as I possibly can about a topic and even having done that I still come to the same conclusion. Great no thank you for that that was yeah it was comprehensive thank you. So <laughs> this is just to answer Khaled's question here so Dom simplistically how would you say how does MFD differ to cupping traditional cupping? Well, simplistically, as simple as you can, yeah. Uh, well, myofascial decompression, I'd say, is kind of like the umbrella term that that basically sums up any any kind of negative pressure or suction therapy. Um, so, I mean, it's like so something like lymphatic touch or even the mechanical cupping machines, as well as just normal cupping, are all myofascial decompression in their own right. I think the the differences between the two. So, if you look at a basic cupping set. Um, where you have a, a pneumatic pump or even like the silicon ones that you squeeze, put it on, it lifts up. I definitively do not know what pressure I'm putting in. So my treatment is on feel, which is good to a certain degree and, and gets better with experience in many cases. But I like to be objective. I like to know exactly what I'm putting in um, and what pressures that I can control. And that's where like your devices like Lymphotouch or your, your cupping devices that you have where you can actually control the amount of suction that you're putting on. I think that's the major difference. The term myofascial decompression or targeted negative pressure is just the umbrella term for the technique. It's like shockwave therapy. You've got different types of shockwave therapy and then you've just got that umbrella of, of shockwave. So, um, but yeah, I think fundamentally the difference is between the fact that you have, um, you know objectively how much pressure you're putting in or, uh, for the patient and then obviously something like cupping which is quite a raw version of it. It's just, you know, you're just going on feel and by, and by sight. Great. Natalie, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that's, that's exactly what I would have said. Essentially, it's, it's the same thing. It's just with, um, you know, devices like the Lymphotouch, it's, it's a lot easier to be very objective about the pressures that you're using. Um, whereas, yeah, my use of the cupping, it was, as Dom said, it was a, a look and a feel and a, uh, that seems about enough pumps um, so not very reproducible. Sure. And, and do you use the mechanical vibration as well, Natalie? Is that something that's that's useful? Um, I'd have to say I haven't used it as much as I probably could have. Um, and uh, I guess yeah, it's it's an it's a therapy in general, like the vibration therapy that I've I've never really I guess explored terribly much. Um, so it's it's something that you know I I really should play around with a little bit more. But um, I think one of those problems is that when you get good results doing what you do, um, you're reluctant to change them. <laughs> so. Yeah. Great. Any closing statements? We're, we're running out of time here, but is there anything else that you, you'd like to add, Dom? I just think like from anybody, I know we've talked about Lymphotouch a little bit, but I think like myofascial decompression, if we remember, it's just a, it's an overall umbrella term. And I think that the importance of using it is the fact it gives you an added extra movement. So with our hands, we're, we're creating a two dimensional force, positive pressure and lateral movements. And that decompression offers you a three dimension. And we've got to remember our bodies are three dimensional. So if we're only working in two dimensions with hands, we're only going to be affecting those tissues in that way. So my kind of effort with thinking why I was so interested in my fascial decompression and, and lymph touch and these kinds of techniques was the fact that our bodies are three dimensional. So if I can treat it in a three dimensional way, in a three dimensional manner, then I'm going to get, res I'm going to get results. And obviously over seven years, it's something that's really complemented hands and other tools and techniques really, really nicely. And I think as Natalie touched on before, we have a reputation as soft tissue therapists, physios for we're good, but it hurts. You know, it's like expect if you've got a bad back, you know, they're going to get the elbows and then thumbs in there. And actually, I like to have my patient walk out going, actually, that wasn't too bad. That felt really nice. That same clinical, you know, outcome, reduced pain, increased function, uh, but they didn't have to go through the trauma <laughs> to get there. 
Yeah, right. and I would say, like for me, the um, the biggest difference that it's made from a clinical perspective is um, those patients who are like a very kyphotic, and you're trying to treat, you know, erector spina, serratus posterior inferior, um, you know, even lats. Um, it's just like there's this the skin and the tissue has been stretched almost like a, a drum skin. Um, over the thoracic cage and I feel you know I, I used to battle with the tissue when I was applying the you know the positive pressure of, of massage type soft tissue release um, it was very painful and it wasn't particularly like it took a lot of time to get anywhere and I found a lot of the time I had to um, you know try and or well, definitely treat the patient in side lying just to try and minimize the the tone that they were having on the uppermost surface um, and I felt like I actually wanted to lie them if I was treating their back it was like I wanted to lie them supine and treat underneath um, which I do a lot for necks but it's a bit harder when you're dealing with the, the rest of the spine um, and to me the the you know the the negative pressure has just opened up a whole new stream of uh, relief for patients because those real tight like rigid it's like treating a rock kind of patient um, they are the ones that respond absolutely the best in terms of um, the negative pressure versus the, the positive pressure of massage sort of stuff. So um, that's been a huge win for, for me, particularly, as I said, with the, the chronic pain patients that I see. Um, a lot of the times the, their lower back is um, dysfunctional, worn out, you know, disc prolapses and all of that sort of stuff because their thoracic spine simply doesn't move and all the movement's been shunted down lower in the chain where movement can actually occur. So our focus is always to get thoracic mobility and in doing so offload uh, the lumbar um, tissue. Um, and yeah, the negative pressure just makes it so much easier to, to get that lot offloading and the movement in the thoracic area. Great. Perfect. No, well, thank you both very much for, for your contributions tonight. It's been really interesting. So, yeah, before we go, though, I would just like to say that we've, we've actually talked about research. We've got another webinar that we're running with Professor James Moore, on, and this is on the effect of positive and negative pressure on the lymphatic system pumping. So it would be interesting, Natalie, if you're able to join that. We'd love to get your viewpoints on, on this area. But... Basically, from our perspective, lymphatic drainage treatments are becoming increasingly popular, but there still isn't a huge amount of education in this area, certainly in the degree courses that, that, that we're aware of. So this session is going to really address this and help us understand more. James is a, he's a professor, so he's, he's really highly educated, but he's a great way of explaining his academic research and applying it to cl clinical practice. So I definitely recommend joining that if, you're, if you've got any interest in lymphatics, which I'm sure everyone does. So if you do have any more questions, then please let us know. Also, we'll be sending out a questionnaire at the end of this. So when Mary sends that through, if you could fill it in for us, it really helps us to, to contribute um, and select what sort of things we're going to be putting in future sessions and help us improve. So again, thank you very much, Natalie. Pleasure. Thank you, Dominic. No problem. Thanks. And yeah, everyone have a good day. Thank you.